Today, I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Swan Private. Now, you know from listening to this show that our money is broken. Fortunately, we have Bitcoin, a better money that will help us build a brighter future. But if you don't have a Bitcoin strategy and a trusted partner to help you execute that strategy, then you're probably going to fall behind. Now, I've known the Swan Bitcoin team for years. The Bitcoiners at Swan are mission driven and have deep expertise and respect in the Bitcoin space. In my opinion, this is the team you want on your side. Today, I'd like to highlight Swan's private client services division, which guides high net worth individuals and businesses around the world toward building and preserving wealth with Bitcoin. So visit swanprivate.com and learn how this concierge service gives you direct access to your dedicated Bitcoin advisor by phone, messaging, and email. Swan will guide you on complex areas such as self-custody, or you can choose to hold your Bitcoin through Swan with one of the largest US regulated custodians. So make your first purchase with Swan Private and get $100 of Bitcoin. Just tell them that I sent you. You know, an opportunity like this to build and preserve legacy impacting wealth for your family and company will not likely be seen again in our lifetimes. Sign up at swanprivate.com today, mention breed love to your advisor and get $100 in free Bitcoin when you make your first buy. Mr. Godfrey Bloom, welcome to the What Is Money Show. Thank you very much indeed. Pleasure to be with you. It's great to have you. Um, just by way of quick introduction, uh, you worked for the City of London as an investment manager at one point in your career. You're also a former member of the European Parliament, and you sat on the Monetary and Economic Affairs Committee. And you're also an Austrian economist and the author of the book, The Magic of Banking, which is now in its second edition, which is a book designed for the intelligent layman who knows he's being scammed, but is not exactly sure how he's being scammed. And uh, just by way of personal introduction, how I discovered you originally was on one of your epic rants on the floor of parliament about the scamminess, let's say, of the banking system. And uh, I always find it to be quite refreshing when politicians speak the truth about money and finance um, in, in the highest echelons of politics. So I wanted to have you on and have a conversation about you and your work. Thank you. So I get there's a lot we could talk about. You know, we're recording this in late what what is the date today? Mid September 2022. Um in the UK, uh the Queen recently passed away. So you guys have a new king now, and I think you said a new prime minister as well. What, how have the developments been from your perspective over the past several weeks? And um, where do you think you, uh, you know, the UK is headed from a political standpoint going forward? Well, uh, the outgoing prime minister <clears throat> was hopeless uh, and his predecessor was hopeless. We now have a woman called Liz Truss, who won't be familiar to Americans at all yet, uh, if indeed ever. But um, she's appointed a cabinet, which is quite good, much better than the last one. But there are two elephants in the room, which she will not discuss. And that is out of control public spending, totally out of control public spending, billions of pounds worth of which is wasted, is ineffectual. In that way, we're just pretty much like America. Uh, it just is a waste of money. She, we, we waste money. Um, probably half national spending is wasted. And the other problem we have uh, is uh, an immigrant problem. We have thousands and thousands of immigrants from Africa uh, arriving at Dover on a daily basis. We put them up in hotels and give them spending money and healthcare, so on and so forth. So they're in now being stuffed in hotels all over the country, and there's about 100,000 of them. And the only way to stop this is to mobilize the Royal Navy and tow them back to France from where they came. Uh, there is no political will, it seems, at the moment to do that. 
So although she's trimming around the edges and she's got some good ideas, the major problems, the major two problems we have at the moment, she's simply not even talking about. So time will tell. Do you think it's even, is it possible for a politician to rein in public spending to the degree that it needs to be? I mean, at least in the US, it just doesn't seem like there's ever been the political will to actually try and get us fiscally sound, let's say. Um, is, is that your experience in the UK as well? Yes, we haven't balanced our budget since uh, uh, 19, sorry, tw- let me think about 1900 and whatever it was. You know, it, it's, it's been 40 or 50 years, I think, since we mm-hmm. actually balanced. And that was a bit of a freak year. But of course, we don't have to balance the budget uh, when we have this system of money printing. Because fiat currency is, as a lot of your followers will know, of course, uh, is just paper, they can print paper to cover over the cracks, knowing that they're only in power maybe for four years or five years, uh, and then when it's, and, and they can run away when it's over. Uh, so this is the problem they do, they just print money. Now, they could if there was political will, because uh, we have um, over, six and a half million civil servants, public employees. That is significantly more. That's about six or seven times more than we had in the 19th century when the empire, the British empire was the biggest in the world and the entire global map was covered in red. Uh, So nobody quite knows what they all do and why we need them. And of course, anybody in the public sector by definition is not a wealth creator. They're a wealth consumer doesn't matter if they're nice people and they do a good job and all the rest of it and they're diligent. That's got not the point. The point is, if you're in the public sector, you're sucking money out of the economy. Now, let me give you a very quick example of that. We have a health system, the national health system, which is free at the point of delivery, which is crashing now around our ears as it was bound to do. It has 1.2 million employees. And don't forget, we're a country the size of Florida. So we're a small country with a relatively small population. So you can imagine just how many people that is, 1.2 million with a massive budget. Now, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Half, 600,000 have no medical qualifications at all. They're not doctors or nurses or radiographers or physiotherapists or surgeons. They're pen pushers. So, yes, if there was political will, you could get rid of at least 300,000 of those straight away. You need some cleaners and administrators, so on and so forth. But nobody's even talking about it. And as it crumbles, government just throws money at it. He says, oh, it's not doing very well. You need more money. And what happens is the NHS, they then employ more people to push pens, but not doctors and nurses. So it's collapsing. Uh, And the United Kingdom is full of problems like that. So uh, I was interviewed by somebody the other day. I said, oh, wouldn't that mean austerity if we cut public spending? Uh, this is not the time for austerity. It never is, is it? It's never the time for austerity. But here's the funny thing is, um, austerity isn't cutting public spending. That That isn't austerity. Uh, so we can get rid of these people. We don't need them. We don't want them. They're in the main incompetent and lazy. So we need to get rid of them, uh, which means if we got rid of all these people and we got rid of unnecessary expenditure like the national health, and a new big rail system that's going in here, which is a hundred billion pounds, because nobody wants it. Go, nobody wants it. You uh, and we have things called quangos, which are uh, government departments on which we spend two or three hundred billion a year. Uh, we have a small holding uh, up here in Yorkshire, uh, and one of these little government offices wrote to us the other day in the hot weather to tell us to make sure that we'd given our horses and our chickens and all that kind of thing enough to drink. We don't need that. We don't need that. We know uh, in hot weather how to look after our animals. We don't need a a city boy in London on a good salary and pension telling us how to do that. And there are thousands and thousands of these people. Sweep them away. Then, of course, you could cut tax and you could leave more money in the pockets of the private sector and the wealth creating sector. And that would help the economy. But it seems that we don't have any politicians that want to go down that route for some reason, and I can't understand it. It seems to me screamingly obvious, but it doesn't seem screamingly obvious to the politicians that we have. 
most of whom, of course, have never done an honest day's work in their lives. They mainly go to Oxford University, they go into politics in some form, and they get themselves a seat in the House of Commons, and then they pick their noses. They, they just don't seem to communicate with everybody. You don't see them in a pub, you never talk to your MP, you never talk to anybody, except at election time, they come round, they pretend they're drinking in the local pub. But they never go in the local pub to speak to people at any other time. It's once every five years. These people are dreadful. They're quite dreadful, and we need to sweep them away. That's it's incredible. It, I guess it is painfully obvious to people like yourself and myself that the the incentives are broken, which is leading to these negative economic outcomes, right? So you know, roughly 50, roughly fifty years we've been off the gold standard. So. It's not surprising to me that you said the, the UK hasn't balanced its budget in about 50 years. You know, once you go off the gold standard, there's basically no tether or anchor to economic reality, and governments are incentivized to just, you know, print currency ad infinitum to paper over every loss to fund every political whim, um, which is essentially engaging in just pure debt monetization. And this is, you know, it, that is it's anti-economic because what you're you're siphoning wealth, as you said, off of the wealth creating sector, the private sector, and funneling it into these public sector programs that no one voted for, no one expressed a preference for. And so it, it really, you know, it, it may sound like a bit of a harsh biological metaphor, but the public sector really is parasitic on the private sector. And maybe you need some public sector for certain things. You know, but when you introduce fiat currency, it seems like it gives the parasite this huge advantage that it just grows disproportionate to the host. And um, yeah, it seems like if we could just get the monetary discipline in place, then you could wash away a lot of these bullshit jobs, right? That that aren't rendering any wealth to the real economy. We had in uh, in in Great Britain. Uh, when we returned to the gold standard after the Napoleonic Wars, the price of a loaf of bread in 1816 was exactly the same as it was in 1900. There was no inflation because we were on the gold standard. You couldn't inflate because we were on the gold standard. And of course, as you will know, and of course a lot of your followers will know, that if you judge uh, gold, uh, and the dollar together, and dollar being the reserve currency of the world, um, which was supposedly going to be the replacement, uh, that the spending power of the dollar has fallen to the tune of around about 96% uh, against gold. So the actual spending power of the dollar has totally and utterly collapsed since the Nick Nixon closed the gold window. And when I'm lecturing at, at uh, universities, uh, Oxford or Cambridge or Durham or wherever it happens to be, I always carry in my pocket a gold sovereign, a gold sovereign. It happens to be dated 1905, but that's not the point. Uh, it's a gold sovereign. In those days, it was the equivalent to a pound coin. Now, in spending terms, that uh, sovereign would buy you bed and breakfast in a reasonably good hotel in London, Paris, New York, or Berlin, or anywhere else. Now, the point I try to impart to undergraduates at universities who are steeped in Keynesian economics, they don't get faculties which talk about anything else, uh, generation after generation. I explained to them that that gold sovereign, if you took one today, it would still pay for bed and breakfast in a reasonably good hotel in London, uh, Paris, Berlin, or New York, because one today is worth 300 and, uh, 350 pounds, let's call, let's call that $400. So you can get a reasonably good hotel bed and breakfast in London for $400. I don't know about New York now. Last time I was there, it was murderously expensive. Uh, but you can do that. And that's when you don't degrade money. And I would argue that in 100 years' time, those, silver, those uh, gold sovereigns will still buy you bed and breakfast in any one of the major cities in the world, because gold is real money. Paper currency isn't real money. It's a promissory note from a bank backed by politicians. You couldn't think, could you, 
of a more useless piece of paper than something issued by banks with the backing of a politician. Totally useless. Totally useless, especially considering the promise that the promissory note represented has been permanently broken, right? It, it used to be a certificate for real money, for gold, and now it's backed by nothing. It's backed by, it's a confidence game, really. And it's a confidence game that we've seen fail time and time throughout human history. So, okay, <laughs> slight pivot here. I was really impressed when you quoted Rothbard uh, on, I think it was on the floor of parliament, one of your speeches. And you basically said flat out, the state is an institution of theft writ large. And it's very rare to hear someone in those chambers speaking uh, about libertarian philosophy or quoting Austrian economists like Mr. Rothbard. What is it like? Why aren't more people talking about that at those levels? It is, is it a matter of the educational background? As you said, many of these people come out of college steeped in Keynesian economics. Is it a matter of the incentives? Is it both? Like, How have we so thoroughly corrupted the political leadership that they're not engaging with economic reality? The whole... Almost everybody who is in politics in Great Britain has gone through the educational system, uh, which is run uh, on Keynesian lines. So we're talking about the second or third generation who doesn't understand money. There's no teaching about money in schools. Kids go to school, they're not talking about money uh, or what money is. Uh, so they, they don't know anything about it. And that speech you refer to, um, interesting, when I made those observations, it went viral on Facebook. Not YouTube, it did well on YouTube, but on Facebook it hit 35 million views. Uh, it's still an all time record, I think, for the European Parliament speech, uh, any speech, anywhere on any subject. Um, so, obviously, deep down, there is a fundamental desire to understand, and people know which is the reason I wrote my book, The Magic of Banking, because it doesn't matter who you speak to. Uh, whether he's a surgeon or a doctor or uh, whoever he may be, he doesn't really understand what's going on. He knows somewhere along the line he's being conned, but he doesn't quite know how it's happening. Uh, and so that's the reason I wrote my book on that, to say, look, this is what money is. This is how it works. Uh, and this is how it's being degraded. Uh, and, of course, uh, inflation, uh, of course, uh, only hurts... Um, uh, hurts the little people, if you will. And your, a lot of your uh, followers, I'm sure, will be familiar with something in economics called the Cantillon effect, which means if you print more and more money, the people at the front of the queue for it do very nicely. They've already got assets and asset prices are inflated. House prices are inflated. But if you're at the back of the queue, the money's already degraded, then you can't afford to actually live. If you're a pensioner, you suffer. If you're a loan pay, you suffer. If you're a blue collar worker, you suffer. If you're a young professional person, even a professional person trying to buy a house in England today, you just can't. Uh, my nephew is on the floor at Lloyd's, Lloyd's of London, fully qualified. Uh, he's 30, 31 years old. He can't think of buying a house in London. It's inconceivable. Uh, he's going to marry very well, so he's going to get a house instantly, which is rather amusing. Uh, so, uh, and I could buy my first house even in 19, uh, 1971 with a 5% deposit, three times salary I could borrow, and I could buy quite, a, quite an acceptable little tiny masonette near the station in London. Not a fashionable part of London, but not an unfashionable part of London. Uh, now, of course, that's been taken away from people, and most people don't understand why and how that's happening and of course it's debasement of the currency but if you ask your average man how this has come about they don't really know uh, and this is something that they've got to know we can't change anything until people understand what's going on yeah it's an e excellent point and i mean at least in the u.s people seem to be thoroughly distracted by democracy really like the the, the right to vote as if that is an adequate mechanism to correct some of these issues, right? If you don't like the way the government's treating you, you just vote in another guy or girl, and that somehow is a fix. But it doesn't address 
the incentive problems, right? There's this a great quote, I don't know who said it, but um, referring to, to democratic elections, said that baby, basically every public election is an advanced auction on stolen goods. So when someone comes into office for four or eight years, right, they don't have a long-term capital interest in the tax base necessarily. So their incentive is to just cut as many deals as possible to enrich themselves or those closest to them before they're booted out four to eight years later. So what can, I mean, it's such a pernicious problem because you've got people with no education about real economics. We're steeped in this, I don't know, democracy being like the holy grail of governance systems. And it's not, right? It's got its own incentive problems. And like you said, people don't understand money. So it's almost like they don't understand how the game is played. So they're getting played. So what, I mean, as, other than this educational work we're trying to do, is there something more systemic we could attempt? Is there, is there another approach we should be thinking about to rectify this? Like, how do you, how do you view this problem and, and trying to approach it usefully? Well, one of the, problems is that you have to go back this is very difficult you have to go back to first principles and think about what democracy actually was conceived as being and so you have to go back to Athens you know 2,000 years ago 1,500 years ago whatever you have to go right back to the the, the, the concept of democracy now the democracy we have today was never what was intended and in fact the Democracy we have today is a rather new phenomenon. There was no, there was no idea that democracy would be a headcount. That everybody who reigned, who arrived at the age of 18 or 21 or whatever it is, gets a vote regardless of who they are or what they do. And if you tried to explain that to a man from Mars who didn't understand the system and he came down, he would stare in wonder at you. He would go, you're kidding me. As soon as your birth certificate says you're a certain age, you get to vote regardless of what you contribute. It's crazy. It's, it's absolutely madness. And of course, although the ancient Athenians didn't know the phrase, it's one of those wonderful American phrases, which I love, which puts its finger right on the button. If you get a vote in the old Athenian days, you don't get a vote unless you had skin in the game. Mm. Uh, so you now have millions and millions of people who are voting to see which government will give them free this right. uh, and it's the same in all the western democracies not just at the Anglo uh, at the Anglosphere, it's not just here in America, it's in the western world I'm going to vote for this guy because he's promised he's going to give me something so I'm voting for him now the something is stolen from somebody else mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Doesn't have any. He doesn't have anything. He doesn't have anything. He has to steal it from your neighbor. And now, of course, he's stolen so much money from your neighbor. Your neighbor doesn't have any money left. So he prints it, which degrades the which degrades the currency. And so the whole charaban goes on. And when I was uh, in a debate at Durham University uh, a few years ago, um, it was a debate on tax. And I tried to explain to the undergraduates and the faculty um, who had had a problem understanding it, because frankly, they're not very bright, uh, that tax is theft, as Mary Rothbard said. But just think about it. What kind of theft is it? Now, in the old days, in the medieval days, the king, your medieval king in the 13th or 14th century, would take your castle, take your money, take your tithes. He would take all of that because he was the king. He was an honest thief. He stole from you because he was the king and he could and he had swords and he had men to do it. All right. That's how it was in the Middle Ages. And it was the same all over Europe. That's that's what kings do. Steal your money. Now, what we have today in a kleptocracy is politicians who steal your money. And what really annoys me is they pretend it's for your own benefit. (laughs) Uh, And that really knocks me. Now, theft is theft. Now, if somebody came up behind you one dark night uh, and bashed you over the head and took your wallet, and as you were lying there on the pavement, blooded, 
if he then whispered in your ear as he took your wallet, don't worry, it's in a very good cause. I'm going to give it to my mother. You've still been robbed. The fact that he thinks it's going to a good cause has got nothing whatsoever to do with it. He's a thief. He's a thief. Uh, and, of course, he takes a cut for himself. He might give it to his mother, but he's had his hand in the till before he gives it to his mother. And then a few men. So all these people are thieves and crooks. Uh, but now here's the problem. Uh, in a democracy, uh, if we have a constitutional monarchy and a, and a, and a parliamentary uh, democracy, not a million miles away to what you've got. You, you, you've got a not dissimilar kind of democratic system. Now, what we've got to understand is that uh, the protection of that is the law. Your constitution... We have a constitution. It isn't documented or written in the same way that yours is, but it's a constitution nevertheless. And it was formulated in 1688. And one of the reasons for the American Revolution uh, in 1776, because they weren't getting the protection of the Bill of Rights in 1688. And they said, just a minute, we're not getting any protection. We're not getting any protection. All right. And so they said, let's go our own way. Uh, and, and, and that's actually what happened. Now, you have law. All sorts of laws, principles of English law. Again, at your in Washington, you have a fair copy uh, of Magna Carta, uh, which was only encapsulating law. Incidentally, a lot of people think that's where it began. It didn't. It began in Anglo-Saxon law. The concept, if you will, sometimes referred to as natural justice, which was an Anglo-Saxon concept, hundreds of years before Magna Carta, mm. and that's developed, and that's developed over many, many years and many, many, many generations. Uh, and the principle of English law uh, is some of the greatest principles in the history of law, uh, globally, regardless. Now, that's been eaten away in the same way that your constitution has been eaten away. Nobody takes any notice of your constitution, and they don't take any notice of our constitution, because it's overridden uh, by politicians who just go around it and pretend it doesn't exist. And they've corrupted the legal system. So your judges are all political appointments. They are here now. They're all political appointments. So they go along with anything. They're not great lawyers. They don't get to the Supreme Court because they're fantastic lawyers with independent thinking and independent minds. They, they're there because they've been put there by a crook. Mm -hmm. uh, it won't expose them. So you have the law which has been degraded, totally degraded, the system of law in your country. Give an example of that is Julian Assange at the moment, held with a total um, suspension of habeas corpus. It is totally against the principles of English law to hold Julian Assange locked up in Belmarsh for years and years without charging him. You can't do that in English law. They've just torn it up and walked away. So that is the sort of problem that you get. They've taken all that away. They've corrupted the system. And here's the second string to the same, same bow, if you will. And that is one of the great protections was a free press. It was a free press. So the press would be saying, you can't do that. Here's our legal correspondent. Uh, you can't do that under the principles of English law. The Bill of Rights, or whatever it is, habeas corpus, the presumption of innocence, which is now gone if you're investigated by the uh, tax revenue or the VAT people, whatever tax people it may be, uh, the concept of your innocence is gone. That's a fundamental principle of both your law and our law here. The principle of it, not on the mainland Europe, the principle of the presumption of innocence. You are presumed guilty now if it's a state investigation. You have to prove your in innocence. And you have no protection by mainstream media, the newspapers, the television. That's all bought and paid for by the establishment. Another brilliant phrase that you came up with in America, deep state. Mm. And now, of course, it's not even deep state. It's oligarchs owning it like Bill Gates. Uh, Jeff Bezos, who owns the Washington Post, uh, Bill Gates, who gives money to the BBC, the European Union gives money to the BBC, so that he who pays the piper calls the tune. All you get from BBC now is the deep state line. <laughs> no dissent. It's the same on climate change. Nobody's allowed to come on te television anywhere to say, just a minute, this is bullshit. <laughs> Here are the graphs. Here's the data. This is a hoax. You can't get on TV. So 85% or 90% of the people in America 
and Great Britain probably think there's a climate emergency because they don't know any better. And all they do, most people, America's no different to here, they watch the television, they watch BBC News at six o'clock while they're half doing something else, they're preparing their tea, they're doing something and they're half looking. Nobody goes back and says, that doesn't sound right to me, I'm going to check it out. Most people in Great Britain believe everything that they see on the TV. And of course, then the newspapers back it up. So there's no access for information for these people. There's no concept of an inquiring mind. There's no concept of risk analysis with these people. And this, of course, is really what Hans Hopper in his book uh, about democracy was trying to drive at. When you have a democratic system, you can manipulate 80% of the electorate because they're all stupid. So uh, we get what the people vote for uh, and how we change it, uh, as I said, going right back to the Athenian concept of democracy, is to change the game. Nobody in the public sector gets a vote. Nobody in the public sector gets a vote because that's going to vote for more public sector spending. If you're not in the wealth creating sector, you don't get a vote. You've got to be in the wealth creating sector and you've got to be a taxpayer. You've got to be a taxpayer. Uh, and then you would have, that would mean that, that at least half the electorate had a deep interest in what was going on and what money is and, and how much tax they're paying, so on and so forth. That is the way, genuine democracy. But we're wedded here. People, even in conservative people, the people on the right are horrified if you suggest it isn't one man, one vote. And I make another analogy there to undergraduates uh, and, and faculties. If you go to the pub in England or you go into a bar in America, let's say there's a dozen lads. It's a lads night out, right? Everybody puts $50 into the kitty or whatever it is, okay, to pay for the booze. And you go from one bar to the next and a good, good time is had by all. Marvellous. Love it. Um, now, if you don't put your $50 in, you don't get a drink because you're not in the kitty. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't expect a drink, would you? You wouldn't expect it. You're not in the kitty. So you don't get a drink. And it's the same in society. If you don't put anything into the kitty, you don't get a vote because voting is basically about how the money is spent. But if you're not putting any money in, you can't have a vote. Now, for those people who say, oh, well, you know, you can't do this, can't do that, it's immoral, all that kind of bullshit. What is immoral is being forced to pay for your neighbour. You're working, he's not working. Being forced to pay for your neighbour, that is immoral. Mm -hmm. And you could do it another way so that people aren't disenfranchised. You could give the wealth creator three votes. And the guy who isn't creating any wealth, one vote. And that would rebalance mm -hmm. our society and our economies. And I think that would be at least something that should be even talked about, but these things aren't even being talked about, are they? Uh, how much longer can we go down this path of degraded currency, bankruptcy, uh, the highest uh, global debt ever? It's something like $270 trillion, isn't it, if you take corporate and mm -hmm. public? These numbers are inconceivable, aren't they, to the public mind? Does anybody really understand that? You and I are in the money business. I don't understand those kind of numbers. They're miles over my head. So we've got to do something, but of course we won't do anything. It's got to get worse. And when it gets worse, what will happen? We won't have everybody saying, my goodness me, we should have been libertarians. The government have created all this mayhem because they're sick and greedy and crooked. They won't say that. They'll say we didn't have enough government. We need a firmer government. We need a different system. We need communism or we need fascism or something and all the rest of it. And more police, armed police, politicized police, and more FBI and all the rest of it. That's what's going to happen when it all collapses. And this is what's happened in history. It happened in the French Revolution. They got a new emperor. They got Napoleon. Uh, the Russians had a revolution and they got Stalin. Uh, the Germans had a sort of revolution uh, after the war and they got Hitler. You, you don't get libertarianism. You don't get free government. You don't get a free society with a revolution. You get more of the same. Uh, and that's where we're heading. Wow. Um, I have brilliant insights on changing the voting mechanism. I scarcely heard anyone ever talk about that. And yeah, it certainly seems to be a recurrent pattern, right? That government 
really mm-hmm. creates a lot of divisiveness in society, which leads to a lot of demand for law and order. And then you end up with a strong man, right? You end up with the Stalin or the Hitler. And then that, I mean, those, that leads to the greatest atrocities humans have ever witnessed when you centralize power to that degree. Now I'd like to tell you about a great new Bitcoin show on the scene that you've got to check out. Brought to you by Swan Studios and Bitcoin Magazine, this show is Hard Money with Natalie Brunel. Natalie is an Emmy-nominated journalist bringing unparalleled experience to the Bitcoin media scene. And personally, Natalie is one of my favorite voices in the Bitcoin space. Each week on Hard Money, you'll get the top headlines of the week with analysis you won't find anywhere else. Hard-hitting interviews with amazing guests like myself and other top minds in the Bitcoin space. And the show will take you directly into the lives being changed by Bitcoin all over the world. Check out Hard Money at swan.com backslash hard money. Today, I want to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. So how does health insurance work? You send an egregious amount of money to an insurance company. They hold it in a pool of depreciating fiat currency. Then when you have a large health event, you have to pay them even more via your deductible. And then you hope they will cover your bill. And in fact, one in six bills are denied by healthcare.gov plans. It's time to take control of your own healthcare bills. I'd like to introduce you to CrowdHealth. It's a decentralization of healthcare using Bitcoin as an alternative to health insurance. Instead of sending fiat currency to a big corporation, you send that money to an account controlled by you, a portion of which is converted into Bitcoin. Then if you have a big health event, you have a community of Bitcoiners that will use the money in their accounts to help you out. To get more details, go to joincrowdhealth.com backslash breedlove, where you can find the promo code for $99 a month for six months. Is, okay, I'm, I'm reflecting right now on the book, The Ethics of Money Production by Holzman. And he makes a number of really compelling ethical arguments about the corruption of money in that book. Um, you know, specifically saying that the monopolization of money production is almost equivalent to voter fraud is one point that he makes because you're, if again, if you're the Cantillion heir that's nearest the spigot, well, it doesn't matter that you only have one vote. You're, you're enriching yourself at the expense of others. So it's, it's a way to disproportionately increase your influence on society, despite the voting mechanism. Uh, another point, this one's very obvious to libertarians, but it's amazing to me how many people don't understand this. Fiat currency inflation is everywhere and always only a violation of private property. Right? That's all it that's all it can do. If you're printing money and giving it to someone else, then you're stealing, as you said, the guy in the back of the queue is being stolen from by the guy at the front of the queue. Right? This is the Cantillon effect. There, you know, it, there's no equitable economic benefit whatsoever from printing money or or engaging in inflation. So if I look at that and then I, I reflect back further on the Magna Carta, you know, when King John signed it in 1215, life, liberty, inviolable property, right? These were these were the whole this was foundational to the idea of uh I guess you'd call it a free market government, right? This is a government that, that serves the people and really should just seek to preserve and promote life, liberty, and property. Anything a government does beyond that doesn't, it's it's outside the scope of what a government has intended to do. So my question is, if we look at, I guess, so in your opinion, to what degree has the corruption of money contributed to the buildup of political corruption or the corruption of our social hierarchies. And then if something like, you know, I'm obviously a huge Bitcoin proponent, I often describe it as incorruptible money, right? It's money you can't print. So in, in theory, it should prevent a lot of the systemic theft that leads to this buildup of the, the public sector, right? Uh, disproportionate to the private sector. To what degree do you think incorruptible money can help clean up 
the corruption in our political and social hierarchies? Well, uh, enormously, certainly, enormously. Let me just take you back to the uh, administration of Lord Salisbury in the, the 1890s, when British Empire was at its zenith, uh, and it was towards the end of the first phase of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, it was the most successful administration in the history of the Conservative Party, or possibly one argues Great Britain. Now, Lord Salisbury, funnily enough, if you look at pictures of with his big bushy beard, and he was from a family uh, of many, many ge generations of aristocrats, he was a libertarian. <clears throat> I'll give you, I could give you a number of quotes, but I'll give you one in particular. He said, "It's only the business of Parliament is to facilitate uh, the entrepreneurial spirit uh, of the Englishman. Hmm. It's not there to regulate him or uh, or do anything. It's there to just facilitate." And this is when. Uh, income tax was sort of about 5p in the pound and, and the tax burden was one tenth of what it is today. Uh, and when it came to health and safety and all that moral type of stuff, he said it's every free born Englishman's right to get as drunk as he likes whenever he likes. It's no business of anybody else. He was a true libertarian and we had an extremely successful administration. And of course, it was on the gold standard. You come off the gold standard when you go to war. Coming off the gold standard is to facilitate war. Uh, so we came off the gold standard to fight the Napoleonic Wars. We went back on it, and it was very successful. We came off it again in 1914. The Americans uh, rather foolishly developed their central bank in 1913 and came into that war in 1917. Uh, the Vietnam conflict was the same. That's why Nixon closed the gold window. He wanted to fund a war. It's about war. Mm -hmm. um, also know, do we not, that wars never work. Nobody ever gets anything from a war. Nobody ever really gets anything from a war. Uh, one of the things that I am as well uh, as, as a city worker, I'm a graduate of the um, Royal College of Defence Studies, so I'm actually trained in geopolitical strategy uh, as well. It's, it's a string, one of the strings to my bow. Uh, and my dissertation that I needed to, to come to there <clears throat> was the Economic Implications of Warfare, which is another little booklet I've uh, I've, uh, I've written uh, some time ago now, but the principle is just the same. Nobody gets to win out of war. It just doesn't happen. Uh, some wars are necessary. Occasionally, I'm not a pacifist, some wars are necessary. If somebody invades the United States, it is legitimate to go to war. Mm. If somebody invades Great Britain, it's legitimate to go to war. It is not legitimate to go to war the other side of the globe because you want to change the regime. That is not legitimate mm. because little people have to pay for it. And of course, the people who like to do this are safe in the knowledge that they won't have to go. So the Washington neocons sit there sending young men to war, confident that they're not going to get their head shot off. They're all right. So it doesn't matter whether it's Syria, Libya, Afghanistan, the Horn of Africa and all the rest of it. They're safe, and they've probably got call options on Raytheon, Lockheed, and all the other warfare manufacturers. And it's no, I'm not making a pop in America. It's no different here. No different here. Um, who wins out of war? And the people who win out of war, people who, make, uh, who actually manufacture war material. No young men gain from it. They just get killed and maimed. Uh, so it's all about warfare. And, of course, in America... <clears throat> a trillion dollar annual budget for military is disgusting. There's no other word for it. It's disgusting. 11 aircraft carrier groups, uh, uh, 800 overseas bases, 200,000 odd overseas military personnel. What the hell is it for? And it's borrowed money. It's borrowed money. Uh, the whole thing's disgraceful, but it's the same people running it in Washington uh, and, and all this, I heard all about this, let's clean, clean the swamp, let's drain the swamp. Nobody's draining the swamp. They're not draining it here. We're no better. We're just on a very much smaller scale. We're huh. just on a small scale. But the corruption is there. The desire for warfare is the same. Why have we got NATO? What's, what's the point of NATO? The Warsaw Pact countries disappeared. They went years ago. What's NATO for? Never mind what's NATO expanding for right up to the Russian border. Who cares about, 
Look, I know this might annoy some people, but nobody really cares about the Ukraine and the Russian Federation. It's got nothing to do with us. It's nothing to do with us. And in the old days of Lord Palmerston and Lord Castlereagh in the mid 19th century, we never went to war unless it affected Great Britain directly. We didn't dabble in other wars. We didn't dabble in other wars. Think what America could do if it wasn't spending a trillion dollars a year, what, what they could do with that money uh, if it wasn't being poured down the lavatory of warfare. It's absolutely disgraceful. Um, I haven't seen anybody, I've got friends, I've got a lot of American friends, right? A lot of American friends. And of course, in my background, some in the military. And I speak to them, I'm talking about fast jet pilots, I'm talking about uh, one-star generals, who I was at college with, and stuff like that, military college and stuff. And I speak to them, they have absolutely no idea why they've got it. They couldn't explain to me why they're doing all this. They don't have a reason, they don't have a rationale. And if you ask what the war aims are, if you talk to them about war aims, they don't know what the war aim is. What was the war aim in Libya, the Horn of Africa, Syria, Afghanistan? They don't know. They just mm -hmm. stare at you. Hmm. And they're not morons. It's only just because of that little bit of their brain doesn't actually ask any questions. Hmm. They just have bigger, bigger budgets, bigger budgets, the CIA. Most of it unaudited. Not audited. They don't know where the money goes in the Pentagon. Mm. It's just loads and loads and loads of money. Uh, and something America's got to address, because at the moment they're still hanging on by the fingernails to the leadership of the free world. I don't give it more than a few years before. Uh, it's all about e economics. If America isn't strong economically, you can have all the aircraft carriers in the world. It's going to make no difference. Yeah, it's, oh, it's heavy and... How can the U.S. be the leader of the free world when it is so blatantly violating the property rights of its citizens to fund all these far-flung imperial escapades? Um, it, it's hypocritical to the core. You know, it, what did what, I think Rothbard said something like this too: that taxation is theft, war is mass murder, conscription is slavery, and so I don't know. I, I've in a lot of my work, I've I've come to really just the incentives to warfare, right? The economic incentives seem to be the driver. So to the degree that we can reduce the profitability of warfare um, seems to be the only way to, to try and constrict it. And that's another area that I'm very hopeful for something like Bitcoin. Right. If the more people hold Bitcoin institutions, organizations, it's just money that's hard to steal. And the harder money is to steal, the less incentive there is to conflict, really. So what are we on the verge of World War Three? Like what's this does not seem to be a good path that we're that we're walking down. You mentioned you've got training in geopolitical strategy and whatnot. What is your view on the current geopolitical situation? Um, you know, if you've got any, I guess, advice for people to kind of sift through all the noise to signal, how can we determine what's really happening in the world and, and where do you see things going from here? Well, I think we're going to see, <clears throat> we're going to see, we're already seeing a major shift from the Anglosphere uh, into the Shanghai cooperation. This is where the this is where this is where the G GDP is growing. Uh, this is this is where the movement is coming from. Uh, so you have a Russia, a Sino-Russia uh, um, uh, compact or agreement, if you will. Uh, you've got the Stans. Uh, you've got the Far East. Uh, all these things are coming together, uh, and these are economies which are growing. They're not warfare or welfare states. Um, the only reason that the Russian Federation uh, went into the eastern, uh, the eastern Ukraine is because of NATO aggression and the CIA destabilization of their elected government in 2014. And they said, no, we're not letting this go any further. <clears throat> so they're not a, a militaristic expansionist and the Chinese aren't either. And they want this. They want control over their backyard. But what they want to do is to make themselves economically wealthy. 
sound. That, that's, mm. that's the direction they're going. And look where we're going with these sanctions. At the moment, it's crippling Europe because it's made the cost of energy unaffordable. So we're now having in Great Britain to subsidise energy to a very, very large degree, billions and billions of pounds, which is printed money again. So the pound fell, it'd be nearly parity with the dollar because everybody knows in the money markets that the more you print, the more you degrade. Now, uh, and we have our politicians saying that it's Putin's fault. Well, you know, it's not Putin's fault. We have brought in the sanctions against the Russian Federation and they've turned off the spigot. Well, they would, wouldn't they? You can't pump billions of dollars into the Ukraine, uh, weaponry and all the rest of it, and, and do all the kind of things we're doing without retaliation. They were bound to retaliate. We've got to remember who started it. Uh, and if you look at a map of Russia uh, and you look at the resources of Russia and China and the central land sphere that they have, you see, they, they, they don't need uh, they don't need maritime uh, powers. They, they're not a maritime. They're not maritime powers. Uh, so consequently, they can go on and build and build their economy, uh, which is what they're doing. We've now because we've closed the gold market in London to. Russian gold, they're now, they've got now a Moscow gold uh, uh, trading center that, 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 uh, in exchange for London. You couldn't think of us doing anything more stupid than that, could you? But we've done it. And sooner or later, we will find uh, that gold is actually, is, is, the main gold markets will be in Moscow uh, and China and, and places like that. And, and London and the Anglosphere will sort of decline and where is our gold? We don't know where our gold is. What we do know <clears throat> is that we have ETFs and things like that and banks who are saying they've got gold, uh, pieces of paper, but they don't have gold. They're manipulating the price of gold. And you can't do that for very much longer. When you lose control of the price of gold, you'll see gold find its true value, uh, which will be significantly more than 17, 17 or $1,800 an ounce. That will change when people start waking up in the West and say, can I have my gold? I've got a piece of paper. No, I don't want dollars or pounds in exchange for it. I've come for good delivery. Give me my gold. And these people can say, we don't actually have it. And when that penny drops, you'll see the price soar um, uh, as, it's, as it's bound to do. And that's going to happen because it will be traded. Nobody is going to want paper promises for gold. They're going to want a piece of gold. And of course, you will know and your listeners will know if you don't hold it, you don't own it. All right. right. If it's not in your safe or in, or in a safe place or, or an independent um, safety deposit box, you don't own it. All you've got yeah. is a piece of paper from somebody, a banker, promising you that he's got it in his safe. And of course, he hasn't. <laughs> he's already leased it or sold it. It's bullshit. And this is what's going to happen to the gold market sooner or later. And of course, that brings us round full circle to Bitcoin, which I hold, but not in great measure. <clears throat> and I've had this conversation a number of times. When you're an old geezer like me, all you want to do is preserve your wealth. You want to preserve, you don't want to make, it's not an investment. Gold isn't an investment. Mm. Gold is an investment. Gold is securing the wealth that you've accumulated over, over the years. And that's why I hold predominantly gold in specie. And don't come and rob me because it's not here. Uh, it's in a, an independent safety deposit box in, in London somewhere. I don't even have a key. So, you know, there we are. It's, it's there. Um, so that's what you want. Uh, and so you've got gold. Now, when it comes to Bitcoin, which is significantly more volatile, uh, if you're younger, uh, you can ride the storm. Mm. You can write volatility. You can say, oh, it doesn't matter to me because I'm only 30 or 40 years old. I can ride the volatility of, of Bitcoin and I can buy on the dips. <clears throat> when you get to 70 plus, that's not really an option for you. You have to go uh, where the, the, the volatility, is, volatility is the least. Now, here's the problem, <clears throat> which I know you will have thought through, but not many Bitcoiners have, which is a shame. Uh, it's difficult to steal. You made the point. But it is still not impossible to steal. And people say to me, uh, who are rather naive in my view, ah, but I have my passcode. I have my, uh, I have all this stuff. You know, you can't get at it because you'd need to know all the coordinates to get my Bitcoin. 
Well, uh, let's say they suspected you of holding Bitcoin. You, you were well known to hold Bitcoin. We live in a world now, even in the Western, so-called Western democracies, where they will kick your door in and threaten to shoot your dog unless you give them the coordinates. That's the kind of world we're living in now. Lockdown was the same. Telling us who could come to Christmas dinner. Grandma can't come to Christmas dinner. We had an arrest here, just locally here, by the police from a, a lady who was trying to rescue her mother, who was 90, from an old people's home because they wouldn't let her go in and see her. Police arrested her. We had another girl arrested for walking a dog in the park. We're not living in the world that we thought we were living in. These bastards can do anything that they like. And if you think your Bitcoin is safe, if they think you've got it, they'll come and if they don't shoot your dog, they'll shoot your children. Or if they suspend habeas corpus, as they have done with Julian Assange, they'll just put you in solitary confinement until you get into them. So it's very stealable, mm. as is gold, because they mm. do the same thing. Um, but we live in times now where the, the government has politicized the police, they politicize the law. Uh, we are living in very, very dark times. But just as dark as Russia in the 1930s or uh, Nazi Germany in the 90s, the, this is the world we're living in. And we need to protect ourselves. And gold and Bitcoin is a good protection against the wealth of our families, but it's not foolproof. And even if I put it in Switzerland, they are still the same. You know, they can lock me up and, and, and throw away the key and, and suspend habeas corpus until I get my people in Switzerland to send it back to England. These are dark times, very dark times. Oh, it's, um, yeah, dark indeed, but I think good to look into that darkness and be ready for it um, ah. because it's here, right? It's real. It's happening. Um, I, you know, the one caveat I would add to that just with Bitcoin, and this is a bit of a technical specificity, but if you use a multi-sig wallet, even if they throw you in solitary, right? And you've got your protocols in order. You don't, well, if you do it correctly, you don't even have the ability to give them the key, right? So you've basically chopped the key into a number of pieces and given it to your trusted circle. And in theory, they could lock you up or kill you. Then your, your um, keys would basically pass on according to that protocol to your heirs. However, it still doesn't stop coercion of your heirs even, right? So there's no perfect solution to this. This is the solution or the problem we've been dealing with for all of human history is like, how do you secure wealth in a way that violent actors can't take it? Um, and gold and Bitcoin is really all we've got. You know, there's, I would say guns, you could add guns and bullets and food and water and all of that mix. And, you know, community relationships, that seems to be a good bulwark against state overreach but you know dark times indeed um so and yeah it's a great point too that you can't hold it with a custodian you can't hold paper claim to it as we say in bitcoin not your keys not your coin if you're not holding gold and specie or holding your private keys in bitcoin then you don't have gold or bitcoin you have a promise from someone else that's very likely to be broken uh in days like this so I can't can't emphasize that point enough. Um, can I can I just please uh, strike a lighter note, if you like, for Americans? <clears throat> I've written um, pieces on my website. There is a problem. I don't believe America, the United States, was ever really united. It's not it isn't united. Um, uh, people say, oh, Lincoln saved the Union. Or Lincoln preserved the Union. He didn't. He enforced the mm -hmm. Union. And yeah. isn't the same thing. He enforced it at the cost of 600,000 American lives, uh, no matter how many maimed. Now, as I see it, for example, and, and excuse me for talking about American politics, which is a little bit impertinent, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> but you see... There is a future for an American citizen. He can leave California and go to South Dakota. He can leave 
uh, Massachusetts and go to Florida. And all he's going to do is get in his car. There's an option where states are run by administrations who aren't going down this route and have resisted this route with some first class people. And these first class people might come back um, into power and take America back to its constitution and back to where America ought to be. I'm a great Atlanticist, or I've always been that until recently, um, <clears throat> an Atlanticist because I believe the Anglosphere is the fulcrum of the free world or should be. Can you tell me what that is, an Atlanticist? Uh, that means somebody who is fundamentally, an Englishman who's fundamentally pro-America, mm. strategically, emotionally. Uh, most people here are. Most most people are. Uh, as anybody, uh, any of your listeners uh, or, or viewers or followers, if they come to England, they will always be made extremely welcome, always, personally. Uh, and it's my experience is when I go to America, and I've been to 35 states in America, probably more than a lot of your <laughs> a lot of viewers have been to. Uh, I have only ever been met with uh, the, uh, with great hospitality and friendship when I go there. Um, so there is an underlying sea. There's a, there's a sea of goodwill. Uh, and if we get... Uh, the right kind of president back and we see more governors of states replacing some of the hopeless governors that we have at the moment. I mean, and you've only got to look at some of the blue states who are almost beyond help. Um, cities like Baltimore and places like that. Th these places are just tragic sinks. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, but there are states which aren't and, and that could be lifted. That, that could be lifted. We could lift America state by state. But I think the only thing that's going to do that uh, is people actually moving. I gather, and you'll know much better than me, that people are already moving from places like California to Texas, for example. Oh, yeah. Uh, where you know they can keep more of their money. They don't have so many idiots. I mean, California is basically a socialist state. And you think of California, uh, one of the most prosperous economies in the world, uh, one of the most beautiful uh, physically geographical states uh, or parts of the world um, is going to be completely crucified by the Democrats. And, and, and I'm not talking uh, party politics here per se, but every really bad state in America is blue. Wow. In the same way in this country, every red state, which is Labour here, which is socialist, every every bad city is red. And, you know, I could drive you around Yorkshire like, and you'd know, I wouldn't tell you, which was which as we drive, drive through the center of the town, you'd know straight away. Uh, and, and there is hope for America. There's great hope for America to come back. If you can kill this warfare habit, and I don't know whether you saw the clip the other day, I can't remember who clipped it. Since 1776, it's only been 15 years when America hasn't been involved in a war. You know, Spain, Mexico, Nicaragua, uh, never mind Vietnam and, and everything. Absolute disaster. Warfare. You've got to stop this warfare, this desire. For... Nobody, take it from me, and I know you don't need to take it from me as a geopolitical strategist. Nobody's going to invade America, all right? <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to happen. And as soon as America understands that, and the people in Washington understand that, they can have their trillion dollars a year back. Hmm. Wow. Well, uh, uh... Yeah, I, it's such a pernicious thing. I, my general view is we just have messed up the incentive systems, right? And we've made progress, but we kind of do two steps forward. Seems like we're taking several steps back at this point. Um, but I am, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that, you know, people learn through the pain. So perhaps we have to go through this painful moment in history to remember the value of life, liberty, and property, right? That's what it's all about. Um, I want to ask you, so about gold again, Russia and China, as I understand it, China has been not only one of the largest, if not the largest producers of gold over the past almost decade, maybe just seven years, They've also been one of the biggest net buyers 
I also know Russia has been a net buyer. I'm not sure about the production. I think they produce some gold as well. They do indeed. Yeah. And, and I know they've been accumulating. So is there a possibility that if there's a union, you know, an economic union, maybe not a union, an economic partnership between Russia and China, that they could, you know, flip the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency? Is that a play you could see trying to be made by that side of the world? And if so, I, I'm sure the response would be extremely antagonistic from the U.S. Could that be the catalyst for, you know, World War III, God forbid? You make some very good points there, and I've pondered it myself. Uh, certainly, China uh, is a big producer of gold. It uh, does not export any gold. Russia also mines gold, and they have been accumulating gold, as have a great deal of, of that sphere, uh, the Shanghai sphere, which I think perhaps the best way of describing it could be as a confederation. That's already happening. Mm. They are investigating uh, a currency. What they're trying to work out is what should the currency be? They know it can't be fiat. They've learned that. Um, they're looking at an asset-backed currency, uh, and they haven't got there yet. Uh, they're thinking it could be part gold, part commodity. Uh, you know, they, they haven't quite worked out where it could be yet um, because they have their own Keynesians. You know, they're not, we're, we're not alone. Uh, and of course, here's the stupid thing. It was the United States that weaponized the dollar. You know, this was a very stupid thing to do. Uh, they're the one that's confiscated dollar assets. I mean, what? who in their right mind would now buy dollar assets lodged in the West when they can be politically seized? If, 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 the, if Washington or London or uh, Brussels don't like that regime, they steal your money. Mm -hmm. uh, this, is the, this is a nightmare. And people, being ex-City of London myself, people don't understand it. You cannot put your hand in the till because you've got a Russian. Let's take that man's money because he's got a Russian name. He's got a yacht. He might not be a very nice person, actually. But you can't do that because everybody goes, oh, you, I'm not putting my money there. Right. It's breaking the rules of the game. If you can't break the rules of the game, uh, otherwise people will find somewhere else to go. Uh, and that's what they are working on now. It's a new currency uh, for trade. They brought, uh, these are big producers of oil and gas and fertilizer and grain. You know, that's what you don't pick a fight with these guys, uh, a, a, a fight with these guys economically, because you can only lose. I mean, look at Russia. Just look at Russia. Uh, we had uh, we put all this uh, sanctions against Russia, um, and of course the ruble shot through the ceiling, and all the other currencies have fallen. Mm -hmm. Now, why did that happen? Well, of course, firstly because uh, Western leaders don't understand money; they're stupid people, criminally stupid, most of them. The Russians can live without a new Mercedes or Audi or BMW or Jaguar; they can live without that which is what we send to them. We can't live what they send to us. Yeah. Grain, gas and oil. You do not need the brains of an archbishop to understand this. What is going on with these people? Are they mad? Because I don't know. I can't think of any other explanation. And it starts in Washington. We follow like poodles. Um, <clears throat> and there's a rumor going around. I don't know whether there's any truth in it. But apparently Boris Johnson snookered a peace initiative in the Ukraine. We could have had a peace initiative, and I don't know the details, and he snookered it. So the war goes on. We pour billions of, the war goes on and on and on. It's permanent warfare. How long is this one going to go on for? Until, of course, we have to give up like we gave up in Afghanistan. You have to give up. You cannot fight endless wars. They're too expensive. The Russians won't feel the draft of it. There's millions of the buggers, millions of them, and they're on the border. They don't have a logistics uh, problem. The people in the Crimea, oh, let's take the Crimea back, and this is terrible. 95% of people in the Crimea are Russian-speaking. They vote in a deficit to be part of the Russian Federation. What's going wrong? I've got in local villages in Yorkshire people flying Ukrainian flags in their garden. 
They don't even, they couldn't point to Ukraine on the map. They're morons. And here's a funny thing in England, I don't know whether it's the same in America, it's our middle class. There's nobody more stupid than the English middle class with their funny diets and their woke attitude to everything. Mm. They're utterly stupid and they live in a world completely of their own. And I don't know what we do because they control the levers of power. They control the civil service. They control the BBC. It's all the liberal in the sense that you use it in America, not I would use it in a Gladstonian sense. Right. The liberal middle class, they've got the levers of power. You'd better giving it to children of five or six years old. Man, such a complicated problem. And yeah, I don't it, it can be quite discouraging. Um but yeah, I don't know. I don't know what really what else to do other than try to keep talking about it and learning about it and hope that we permeate people's minds, right? How crazy this system is that we've created for ourselves. It's it's somewhat obvious if you really just understand taxation and inflation are theft. So if you build your entire you know narrative structure on lies covering up theft, of course it it de devolves into this this warfare that we're seeing. It's just really Oh, really bad. Um, okay, let's try to end on a, a high note here. <laughs> right. I've got to think of something that's good news. I can't look at <laughs> So uh, just to circle back to your book, maybe the magic of banking. I mean, this is what we're after here, right? So you said it's designed for the intelligent layman who knows he's being scammed, but is not sure exactly how. And I often say this getting into Bitcoin and going down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, it's, a, it's an extremely fulfilling intellectual experience, philosophical experience in a way. You're just learning so much about the history of the world, history of money, et cetera. But the flip side to that is you're also realizing that almost everything in the world is a scam. Almost every, like social security is a scam. You know, Medicare, your government, your... All, you know, many companies that you engage with, uh, I don't know what healthcare is like in the UK, but here you're constantly getting scammed out of money, right? They're, they're like, pay this bill and get your reimbursement and they never reimburse you. So it's just like, we're living in this minefield of scams. And I would love to hear how your book just elucidates that for, for the layman, like, um, because it, it can be a bit extreme. Like if I just walk up to someone off the street and say, Hey, you know, almost everything we're living in here is a scam. It can be off putting. How do you approach that, that dialogue and, and what, what have been, I guess, some of the results from, from publishing the book and, and feedback you've gotten on it? Well, the book has done very well. The retired editor of the accountancy magazine which is a major leading money magazine in england said it should actually be issued to every sixth form in high school so you know it, it's got a chapter on money what is money what's the history of money uh it's got a chapter on uh, it's got a chapter on everything i could think of and i've got brought in one or two guests i brought in alistair mcleod uh who's written something i think on bitcoin uh, and somebody else uh, and I've, I've got um i've got various people who've added contributed a chapter so it's not just me but it's mainly me and i also got some old friends in the city some young uh, enthusiastic supporters of mine uh, in the city of london um to update all the graphs so there's lots of pretty pictures and i always think a pretty picture can tell you know, I mean, one look at the slump from from the dollar against gold since closing the Nixon window, for example, stares you in the face uh, and it get, you go crikey. Uh, you know, it, it shows you all these things. And I even got the intelligent layman was the idea. But I got a note for a feedback from a, a Wall Street guy a couple of years ago that was on the first edition, which wasn't brought up to date. Second edition is much better, much fuller, much more in depth. Uh, a more up-to-date graphics. But he wrote and he said, uh, that the old one, the first edition, you could read in 40 minutes. This takes about an hour and a half to read, um, which is the whole idea of it. People don't want a huge tome to read. They don't want that. They want to be informed. And he said, my trip into Wall Street, I take the train every morning and I could read it. 
I could read it in the trip. It's 40 minutes in. And I could actually open it and finish it by the time I got to my office in Wall Street. And he said, uh, I've been a, he'd been a broker. I think he was a broker. He said, I learned loads. He said, I'm in the business. He said, I learned loads. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. But it shows all of us can learn something. It doesn't matter how expert you are or think you are. You can always learn something. I've been reading some stuff recently on two things on the English Civil War um, so that we can, I've got an understanding of what happened last time round and the French Revolution, so I could understand what was going around last time in some depth. Um, and I'm learning. I thought I was pretty good at this kind of stuff. I thought, well, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Uh, so that's where the, that's what the book's trying to do. And it's at cost. It's not a profit making concern. It's at cost. I don't make any profit out of it. Uh, mm. And you can get it on Amazon and you can get the electronic version for Americans much easier. Although the graphics aren't so good, as you would imagine, because mm. the colors not so well. But, you know, yeah, it's OK. <laughs> your your, your just could re easily make make sense of it. That's wonderful. I, I love that you made it very accessible and short and sweet. Um, whatever it is about this topic of economics, it's definitely dry enough to turn away most people. So the art is making it, yeah, just compressed and accessible. So that's, that's a laudable but accomplishment. Just picking up on your point about um, Bitcoin, it's the same with gold. <clears throat> don't forget, most people's portfolios don't hold more than 1% gold mining or specie or anything it's really tiny 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 uh and people i've put into gold or, or suggested they buy gold to preserve their wealth men of my own age perhaps uh who just you know what am i going to do with it uh, uh and i tell them it gold in specie if you want to protect you and your family is probably the best call um and and bitcoin as well but i don't advocate Bitcoin simply because i don't feel i'm an expert enough of an expert on bitcoin mm. To, to you know, they go to a Bitcoin expert and he'll tell you what he thinks and, and listen and learn. But it's just the same with gold. You know, if people have never owned gold, they, they read everything that's about gold, they mm. check the price of gold every day, they look at stuff and they look at the gold bloggers like Alistair McLeod and uh, and Cloudy on Grass and Switzerland and like that. And they very soon, you very soon, if you've got skin in the game, you very soon become an expert. If you hold it. You soon take a really serious interest. Not academic. Yeah. Not a doubt. You really, if you hold it, which is like Bitcoin for me, I read stuff on Bitcoin because I hold some. I don't hold much, but when you hold it, it concentrates the mind. Yes. Or you improve your education. Um, and some people didn't even know how to buy gold. Some people said I was interviewed once by some a big Bitcoin guy in Australia. Uh, <clears throat> and he said, "Oh, yeah, it's a bit complicated buying gold." Is it? No, it's no, it's not easy. <laughs> You just go down to a bullion dealer in London, uh, you buy in specie, and you put it in his lockup, in his downstairs, in his safe deposit. And if you need any, you go, you get it out, you go upstairs, you put it over the counter, and he gives you cash it's straight into your bank account for it. It's very, very easy. Hmm. Uh, buying and selling gold is very, there's a spread. Of course there's a spread. There's a 3% spread. Uh, but there we are. There is on anything. There is on a stock. There is on a bomb. There is on a, uh, anything else you, you want to buy. There's a spread. But you yeah. put it downstairs, go upstairs and cash it in if you want to. It's really, really easy. Yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's a strange thing because when we go many generations without seeing a hyperinflation, the people just become very comfortable with the dollar or the pound or whatever it may be. But it only takes one of those events, right? Where they they confiscate your assets or seize your bank account, or it only needs to happen once for you to get, you know, royally fucked, so to speak. But if just holding gold or Bitcoin, you know, money that cannot be counterfeited protects you from all of that nonsense. So, um, and your point too, to just own a little bit. I've always said this that where where money goes, your mind follows. So if you're really curious about either one of these assets, like just buy a little bit and it will certainly make you more curious. Good advice. Yeah, excellent. I'll give that same. I tell you, we haven't touched on and that's silver. Mm. Now, silver's a funny game and I hold silver. I don't hold much, but I hold, you know, not insignificant amount of silver because in Britain, silver was the coin of the realm for hundreds of years. Mm. Why it's sterling silver, sterling 
you know, silver, silver, sixpenny. Because if we go into a if we go into a better world, a brighter world, where real money comes to the fore, um, what are you going to do if you want to buy a pound of potatoes and you've got a gold sovereign, which is worth? <laughs> right. It's not divisible enough. <laughs> no, exactly. Whereas silver, silver coinage has stood the test of time, and it's real silver and it's sterling silver. Um, and the silver Britannia I have, and of course in America you would hold silver dollars. That's something else I would just advocate. Mm. Silver is also unbelievably volatile. And just at the moment, I would argue silver is desperately underpriced. Uh, silver is a steal at mm. the moment, if you've got time to sit it out. Uh, and you can buy a whole pile of silver dollars. Uh, and they're good for kids, for you know birthdays and, and christenings. And it's a real fundamental thing as a silver mm -hmm. dollar a dollar is a nice piece of kit to have isn't it tactile you got it in your hand um and you don't need to put it particularly in a safe lockup at the moment the day will come maybe and it's something that could quite actually become spendable when you go into the market you know a silver mm -hmm. a silver uh, or something like that if we go back in that route or, or the divisions of, of, of a dollar uh, no, it's it's all it's exciting, and people. The more people take an interest in it, the better it is. The more knowledgeable an electorate is. Yes. Yeah. They, which is why they they stick to one man, one vote. This is why the establishment, deep state, stick to one man, one vote because they know that they can con eighty percent of the people. They know they can do that, especially when they control the media. <laughs> Mr. Godfrey, I, I I've taken more of your time than I intended to. <laughs> Um, I appreciate you sticking it out with me. I know these are not especially fun topics to talk about, but, um, very important nonetheless. And, um, yeah, if, if, if you have any kind of final words for the audience, um, please feel free to share or, uh, at least let them know where they can find out more about you or your work. Uh, I just plugged my website, if I may, it's easy small case godfreybloom.uk godfreybloom.uk uh it's got articles it's got blog it's got sort of videos it's got the stuff i've been at it for some it also has as far as the spike protein uh therapy it has the biggest english speaking web pages on this subject going back three years in europe mm. anything you want to find out is there and it's the same with climate. Hmm. You want to find us, it's on my website, it's climate, uh, and there's articles on NATO and, and all that kind of stuff. It's absolutely full of stuff. And my wife says, the reason I don't have any mates is because I'm always right. <laughs> <laughs> what a price to pay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, well, this has been a lot of, I mean, it has been a lot of fun. I know the topics aren't necessarily fun, but I do appreciate uh, your wit and your work. And this is a great conversation. So thank you so much. Great pleasure. Thank you for inviting me.